Amen. Saints, I have a wonderful word for you today on identity and attachment. Uh, so I want us to go back to the situation of uh, Joseph being introduced as a character and just uh, quickly rehearse, remember what happened to him in his early life. He was 17. He was the favorite son. Everything looked good for him. Daddy gave him a special coat of many colors. And uh, one day he sent him out to look for his brothers, four of his brothers, the, the sons of Bilhar and uh, Zilpah, who were looking after sheep. And uh, he found they'd moved on from where they had been and he had to go and find where they were. And as he went there, they could recognize him. And the reason they could recognize him was that coat that he had. They said, oh, that's him. And we don't like him anymore. We're fed up with him. Let's just kill him and finish with him. Uh, so that was a dreadful thing that uh, happened because they threw him in a pit while they debated what to do. I think it was Judah that um, tried to play for time. And then as they were eating lunch, imagine they've, they've stripped him off his coat, put him in the pit, and they're just casually eating lunch, deciding whether to leave him there to die. They see these Ishmaelite traders coming along the road and they come up with this idea, well, better to sell him into slavery than to kill him. And even the ones that wanted to save him, uh, you know, I think it was Reuben, was, was saying, you know, well, I guess it's better than killing him, you know. So it was a terrible thing. And then, of course, they had to try to explain it to their father. So they came up with this bright idea. Let's take his coat of many colors. Let's kill an animal and let's dip it in the blood. And then we'll take it back to our father and say, look, we found this on the way. And um, it looks awfully like Joseph's coat. Could you check it for us? And, of course, it's a setup. And how they can be so cruel to their own father, let alone be cruel to Joseph, is something that I've been reflecting on the more I think about this story. And how their father ever forgave them, let alone Joseph, is also another mystery that I've been reflecting on. Because we always look at Joseph and say, oh, well, isn't it wonderful that Joseph forgave them? But what about their father who lived for years thinking that his son was dead? I'm amazed that he ever forgave them. Um, you know, in one sense, it was real grace on his part. He, he must have grown, as we'll see as we go through the story today. So, of course, they say to him, yes, that coat identifies him. And now uh, we move to what happens gen in Genesis 37, 34 to 35. We see that uh, Jacob tears his clothes, puts on sackcloth and starts to mourn. And he's inconsolable. And he says, I don't think I'm ever going to stop mourning for my son. It's just so bad what's happened. I, I think this is how I'm going to die, just being sorry for my son. And for those who have lost people really close to them, I've noticed this. And I know it's a reaction that people go through and hopefully they get out of it. But actually, if you study the life of Jacob, you'll find that he really didn't get out of it properly until he actually got back in touch with his son. So the story moves on and he marries the daughter of Shua. The, the Bible is very interesting in that women are never mentioned by name generally in the Old Testament accounts early on, at least, unless they do something of great significance. So we never know what the name of Judah's wife is. So Judah's wife um, gives birth to a son and calls him Ur. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Uh, and, and so that's his identity. That's his name. Uh, when, we, when we get to the end of this message, I'll tell you what it means. Now we have another move into attachment. In, in a few verses later, Judah takes a wife for this uh, he's now grown up he's probably still very young from what you can gather from the account of how long joseph was away in egypt it seems that all this happened quite quickly so he may have been 13 14 16 years old there was no minimum age of marriage and he gives him a wife by the name of tamar and 
Tamar, I'll tell you, means palm tree. It's the, it's the word for palm tree. And, and so she was a Jewish girl, even though Judah himself had married a Canaanite. He was doing better for his son, Ur. And there's an attachment. They get married. In the Hebrew, you say he took uh, a woman to himself. He took a wife. And now I want us to imagine for a minute these main characters that have been introduced. So I want you to think about what was it like for Judah? What was it like for Ur? What was it like for the wife of Judah? And what was it like for Tamar as we go through this story? And if you have no real imagination, then I have a suggestion for you. Just imagine that you're Ur and you won't have to imagine for long. Amen. So let's go to the next verse, third, uh, verse 7. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord took his life. Now, as I said in my daily devotional, uh, many people have a problem with this. But I don't see any other way of reading it than how it's written. In other words, Something that Ur did, something in Ur's behavior, caused God to feel very offended. And he determined that this Ur should no longer be there. He didn't want to look at him anymore, didn't want to watch his behavior anymore. And uh, he essentially removed him. Now, God doesn't tell us why. And maybe that's a good thing. Because, you know, uh, we're very much like this uh, when we are young and rebellious that if your parents say, make sure you don't drink any alcohol when you're at university. <laughs> if you're not careful, it puts it in your mind. You keep thinking about it. You think, ah, they're not here to watch me now. I'm going to the bar. <laughs> you know. So God doesn't tell us uh, what's happening here and perhaps for our own good. So he's gone. Now, there's a law in that time in the Middle East, and it still carries on to this very day called the Leverite uh, Law of Marriage. So if your older brother marries to somebody and doesn't have any children, you have an obligation that you're supposed to now take that lady, look after her, and have children who become your brother's children so that his name lives on. So we see in Genesis 38, 8, Judah said to Onan, have relations with your brother's wife and perform your duty as a brother-in-law to her and raise up a child for your brother. But... He is a bad-minded person. And without going into great detail, I'll just give you a pictorial illustration, if you're very clever. Genesis 38, 9, it says, Now Onan knew that the child would not be his, so when he had relations with his brother's wife, he made sure that she didn't get pregnant. And that was really bad, bad attitude. And the reason he was doing it is most likely because under their customs, if she had given him a child, one, the child wouldn't be his, two, he'd have to pay to raise up that child, look after the child, parent the child, but three, that child would then inherit the double portion that's due for the firstborn, so he would be diluting his own inheritance and also having to pay for it. So in his wickedness, he made sure it didn't happen. And guess what happened? There was another funeral, amen? Uh, God looked at what he did and now we know what it was he did and God was very disgusted with it and God ended his life so it's very rare in the Bible that you see God directly intervening and destroying people but it does happen remember it happened to Herod one day Herod was congratulating himself on how wonderful he was and giving a big speech and uh, the Bible says God struck him dead so we must be careful, uh, and I hope uh, none of us on this uh, Zoom call would ever be in that position where we are acting so wickedly that God might directly take action against us. But it's a possibility that you should never forget. Amen? Now, what we see is there's some time passes by, and after a considerable time, in verse 11, Judah said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up. For he thought, I'm afraid that he too may die like his brothers. 
So Tamar went and lived in her father's house. Now, that's a tough, tough prescription, isn't it? Why did he do it? He did it because he looked and saw that two of his sons married to this woman had already died quickly. Uh, he probably wondered, you know, was she that bad a cook? Um, did she poison them? Uh, what did she do to my sons? And yet, of course, he was wrong to think that she was a very perfectly good wife. But he was afraid to now say to his third son, go and live with her. He said, oh, he's too young. Um, I'll hold on to him until he's ready, and then I'm going to let him come to you. Then in the next verse, we see that a long time passes, and there's another funeral. And this time, it's the daughter of Shua, Jacob's wife, whose name we still don't know. And she dies, and Jacob buries her. And yet, Tamar is still waiting for a husband, still waiting to try and have children, still waiting to leave something in the earth. Can you imagine how frustrated she must have been about her circumstances, about how bleak the outlook looked, as if the whole world was conspiring against her, and even God, she may have wondered if God was against her. Then we find in the second half of this verse, when the time of mourning was ended, Judah went up to his sheep shearers at Timnah. So he's going on a journey. Now, this was a small community and word got around. Somehow she heard that he'd gone up there. She knew where to go and she hatches a plan. So she decides, I'm going to go and dress up. I'm going to cover up my face so he won't recognize me. And I'm going to go and sit by the side of the road up there. And she had this plan. So he comes up and sees her by the side of the road and thinks, hmm, that's an attractive looking young girl. But why is she sitting by the side of the road? He talks to his friend and they determine that she must be having her services for hire. And so they determine here in Genesis 38, 15, that she must be a prostitute. So Judah is attracted to her. He's recently lost his wife and uh, perhaps that's part of his temptation. So he goes up and starts to negotiate um, with her and uh, she says well i want a goat um and then you can have what you want i'm not going to go any further on that one and and he says well i don't have a goat now you see how smart this lady is she must have known he wouldn't have a goat i believe she knew there were only sheep around at the time so she says to him well okay how do i know that you're going to come up with this goat and and uh, he says, uh, what do you want? She says, well, give me your seal, your seal. Give me your cord and give me your staff. Amen. Now, I believe that the cord um, here is the, the mantle that is on him. Now, his mantle is his covering. It's his strength that he's giving her and a, sing, a symbol of his strength. Remember when the mantle falls off the prophet Elijah in 2 Kings chapter 2. It's the transfer of power to Elisha. So that was a dangerous thing to do. He was giving his staff. His staff is his protection. Amen? And he's giving his seal. His seal is his promise. Amen? So he's giving her all the best things that, and also it confirms his identity. So it's like giving somebody your passport in those days. And so he gave all this to her in order to get, what he, to get what he wanted. All right, so taking up in uh, Genesis 38, 24, we go forward three months and suddenly Tamar is pregnant. And isn't it interesting that, uh, so she's pregnant and the word comes back in this small little dwelling place where they are hey, your daughter-in-law has been, um, you know, busy. And um, she's not married, is she, by the way? And uh, in those societies, the patriarchs would have been the judges. So at that time, you definitely had um, Judah and you had Jacob, and I believe Isaac was still alive. So between them, they would have heard this story and they would have to decide what should happen. And the one most directly involved, of course, was Judah. 
And Judah's immediate response, as, as the scripture records, is, well, let's set fire to her, let's burn her, because she's acted like this, and she shouldn't have done so, she deserves to die. So he picks a, a horrible death for her. And there's a great hypocrisy in this, isn't there? Because, of course, uh, he has only three months ago um, been engaging in certain transaction, which he's now condemning so much uh, the consequences of. Um, but of course, the story goes on. And so we go to appeal. <laughs> and she sends the staff and she sends the mantle and uh, she sends the ring. And she says, oh, okay, if you want to do that, that's fine. But um, I just want you to know who did this to me. Have a look, if you wouldn't mind, um, at this ring. Have a look at this mantle. Have a look at this staff. And of course, since they were his things that everyone knew he had uh, lost them and they'd gone missing, um, they all recognized them. So Judah really had no option at this stage um, but to um, put his hand up and say, look, I'm wrong here. She's right. Um, I am the cause of this problem because I should have given Shalah to her and I didn't. And now um, this is what's happened. Now, this is just God's grace at work because imagine otherwise this lady Tamar would have never um, been recorded in the scripture. She would never have featured. Her life would have, her name wouldn't have even been noted. Um, she would have just uh, passed from the pages of history. But because of what she did here and how wisely she acted, she's recorded um, to this very day. And she's an example to us. And we're told that there's another detachment here that Judah never had relations with her again. Um, I believe this means up until the time of the birth, because actually in Jewish uh, traditions, um, they did have other children after that. Now, going quickly to verses 29 to 30, we come to the birth. And at the birth, the midwife is there and she's watching the action and she's looking at the children and she sees a hand come out and she's, ah, quick, let's put a cord on this hand so we, need, we know which one is the firstborn. And then the hand goes back inside the womb. Can you imagine? This must be such a rare occurrence. I think even um, midwives that have given birth to many twins, I wonder how many of them have ever seen something like this. So that hand goes back in and then suddenly the other brother decides to come out first, pushes the other one back maybe, and pops himself out first. And it makes us think, of course, of uh, something that happened in the family a little earlier on with Jacob and Esau, it, although Esau came out first, but Jacob still managed to go in front of him for a while. And so what we have here is this child that pushed his way out, and he's called Perez. And the name Perez means a breach. Praise the Lord. So his identity is confirmed by his action. Now I want to try and sum up this message and uh, help us to apply it. Now, let us do some judgment here. I think the easy judgments are uh, guilty, Onan, guilty. Both guilty of what? Being wicked men. And God himself made that uh, decision and he acted on it. So who are we to argue with that? Judah, if we're very kind, he's definitely guilty. But I think because he put his hand up at the last minute, he got a suspended sentence. Then we have uh, Tamar. Tamar is found innocent and damages are awarded. And they're awarded by the Almighty in as much as she doesn't just have one child, she has two. And remember at this time, Judah had no posterity. He was like Abraham before he had had a son. He had nothing. But now, thanks to his daughter-in-law acting so uh, prudently, he has two grandsons. Praise the Lord. Now, I want us to look at some lessons here. Uh, let's notice Tamar. Tamar has two bad husbands because God steps in. Uh, she gets lied to by her father-in-law. She gets told, go back to your father and just stay there. 
and uh, you know we'll, we'll we'll call for you when we want you, which was never. Uh, yet she was smart and righteous, and she received a double blessing that carries on to this day. Now we can see so much good in Tamar and things that we need to hold on to in the way that she acted. And I'm going to come back to her, but I just want to make a note there. So let us um, do a learning point here and a prayer point. And the, the first learning point that I have for us here, saints, is this. When events in my life go badly, wrong, and for a long time, it doesn't mean that God doesn't have a purpose for me. Amen? And so Tamar is our example that you can be going through life and you can be saying to God, why is this happening to me? It's not fair. It, it just doesn't make any sense. I look at everyone else. Their lives are good. My life seems so rotten. I'm always sick. I, I can't get a job. Um, nobody wants to be my friend. No one wants to marry me. All those kinds of things can be going on in our minds. And yet Tamar is an example to us that if we hold on and we pray hard, and we use what God has given us up here between our ears, we can find a way through. And so my first prayer point is this, Lord, help me to hold on to my faith through tough times so that your purpose will be seen. Amen. Help me to hold on to my faith through tough times so that your purpose will be seen. Say an amen to that, saints. Put it in the chat if it means something to you. Amen. And then we look at Judah. And then we look at Judah. Judah had two dead Judah sons. Two so Judah, we have two dead sons, a dead wife. He's lost three people. He hires a woman, and then he condemns a woman for hire. He is a hypocrite, but he did own up when he was caught. So his record is pretty poor, but uh, he shows us something, because God still blessed Judah in the long run through his descendants as had been prophesied um, if you remember by um, the prophecies of Genesis 49 the prophecies of Israel the prophecies of Israel over his sons now we have this man who's owned up and he's been caught and let's take a learning point from him we should pray and get answers rather than suspect and judge you know we live in an age of conspiracy theories um, and we can become very suspicious of people and always untrusting and uh, thinking that they must have pulled a fast one on us. But we should learn to pray and get answers first or investigate properly before we come to a judgment. We should keep promises and trust God. And we should recognize that hypocrisy is always wrong. So pray that God will help us. So my prayer point here, very simple. You can pray it out loud on your screen if you like. Lord, help me not to be immoral or be a hypocrite. Help me to own up if I'm wrong. Amen? Or when I'm wrong. Because remember, we're always going to be wrong sometimes. Praise the Lord. Let's look at ourselves and make another learning point. I want you to try and make a mental list or even write down um, all the major things that have gone wrong in your life. And then I want you to pray this prayer. Lord, may I identify as your child and attach myself to you, holding and trusting no matter what happens. Do you see the identity and the attachment there? Amen. Praise the Lord. I think we're behind with the slides. Um, so learning and a prayer point. So now I want us to just talk about uh, the, the main characters very quickly as I close this message. Um, look at uh, his name means watcher or awake, but he didn't watch himself very well. I don't know if maybe he was some kind of, um, uh, you know, bad person in terms of how he used his eyes, um, but he was spiritually asleep. And so we need to take a lesson from him that he didn't really live up to his name. If you have a good name, a good Bible name, and it means something, investigate what your name means. It may not even be a Bible name, but it's probably got a good meaning. And try and, if you have a, a name with a good meaning, say, Lord, help me to look, live up to my name. If you have a name with a bad meaning, consider changing it. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Or just give yourself another name. It's a scriptural basis. 
Onan. His name means strong, but he only proved to be a strong-headed, tough-headed guy. He didn't live up to his name in terms of what he was supposed to do, look after his wife, protect his family, and so on. Uh, Shalah, his name means prayer or petition. And God had answered Judah. He'd given him a third son. He had three arrows, but he couldn't bear to see that son uh, going with this woman, Tamar, because he had lost faith. So when we pray, saints, we need to believe. And finally, Tamar. Tamar is the, the real center of this story. She's the one that, she has a whole chapter that revolves around her because she becomes so important in the whole history of the world. Literally, that's not an exaggeration. She lives up to her name. You know what a palm tree does? You plant it in the desert and it still puts down long roots, finds the water and grows and produces fruit. When people see palm trees, they're very happy. Amen. We have a whole church called Elim named after a place where there were 70 palm trees. Very big church around the world. And, and so she held her head up high and she was very fruitful. You know that the, the Jewish scholars say about her that probably King David was who he was because of Tamar. You see, Tamar looked at her life and she saw that she was in a tight spot and there was hardly any way out, but she came up with a battle plan. She came up with something that was so creative, so well thought out. She could think through the chess moves and she knew that, okay, if I do this, then the chances are that this man who's just been bereaved might do that. And when he does that, then three months later or so, this is what's gonna to happen to me. And how am I gonna get out of that? Ah, oh, yes, I'm gonna have something that proves that he's involved. And then that's my get out of jail card. And I'm blessing my family by doing this because this man isn't gonna have any posterity if he doesn't do something because he's frozen with fear. But I'm gonna exercise faith and I'm gonna make the line of Judah live on because perhaps she even remembered that prophecy that said out of Judah, the ruler shall come. And so she acted by faith and acting by faith, she saw tremendous results. And so Tamar becomes to us a fantastic example of faith and action and courage. And so I want us to take those lessons from her life today. And, and if you get it, put an amen in the chat. Amen. Now, here's our final prayer. Romans 10, 9 says this, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And it could be there's somebody listening in directly to the sound of my voice now. You're not saved. You're in trouble. Maybe you're even somebody like Ur or Onan. You know that God has got you in his telescopic sights and you're a dead man if you don't change. Amen. And so, or you could be somebody like Tamar who's locked up in circumstances, but you can't see a way out. Well, God's wisdom in you by virtue of the new birth, by giving your life to him, can unlock your true potential. So if you're in that situation where you have not yet surrendered your life to Christ, I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Say this, dear Lord Jesus, I am a sinner and I'm in need of a savior. You are the savior. I'm asking you please to come into my life. Take my sin away from me. Make everything new. Put a new heart in me. Uh, and cleanse me first and fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord, that I can live a life to please you, that I'll have power to conquer sin in my life, that I will have inspiration from you to know what to do, and Lord, I will be protected by you from my enemies. Father, I surrender myself to you now. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me, and that he rose again on the third day. And therefore, his power in me gives me the confidence and the surety that I have been uh, delivered by what he did by taking my sins on the cross and dying in my place. 
oh God, let his power come into my life now and let me live for him from this day forward. Direct me to a good church where I can grow in matters of faith and be discipled. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I really hope and trust that pray that prayer uh, on hearing this message. God bless you, saints. Um, now we're just going to pray uh, one last prayer. Father, thank you again for this day and this time together. Thank you, Lord, for the praise and the worship and the life that is in this church. After 10 months almost of lockdown, Lord, we are grateful to you that you are keeping us, you are sustaining us. Lord, that the number is being kept by you because you are the great shepherd of the sheep. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you will encourage every heart. I pray you will strengthen every mind. I pray you'll give grace to those who are in need. I pray you will heal the sick. I pray, oh God, you will raise up any, oh God, who have become discouraged. Lord, that you will encourage their hearts. I pray, God, you will be a friend to those who feel lonely. I pray, oh God, during this lockdown, Lord, as long as it continues, Lord, may we continue to grow unusually well. Lord, may it be a true blessing to our souls as it gives us opportunity, as it buys us a few extra minutes that aren't spent commuting. Lord, as it does things for us that allow us to focus on you, help us to take full advantage. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. In my life, that I will have inspiration from you to know what to do. And Lord, I will be protected by you from my enemies. Father, I surrender myself to you now. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me and that he rose again on the third day. And therefore, his power in me gives me the confidence and the surety that I have been uh, delivered by what he did by taking my sins on the cross and dying in my place. Oh God, let his power come into my life now and let me live for him from this day forward. Direct me to a good church where I can grow in matters of faith and be discipled. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I really hope and trust that pray that prayer uh, on hearing this message. God bless you, saints. Um, now we're just going to pray uh, one last prayer. Father, thank you again for this day and this time together. Thank you, Lord, for the praise and the worship and the life that is in this church. After 10 months almost of lockdown, Lord, we are grateful to you that you are keeping us, you are sustaining us. Lord, that the number is being kept by you because you are the great shepherd of the sheep. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you will encourage every heart. I pray you will strengthen every mind. I pray you'll give grace to those who are in need. I pray you will heal the sick. I pray, oh God, you will raise up any, oh God, who have become discouraged. Lord, that you will encourage their hearts. I pray, God, you will be a friend to those who feel lonely. I pray, oh God, during this lockdown, Lord, as long as it continues, Lord, may we continue to grow unusually well. Lord, may it be a true blessing to our souls as it gives us opportunity, as it buys us a few extra minutes that aren't spent commuting. Lord, as it does things for us that allow us to focus on you, help us to take full advantage. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.